Honestly, who comes up with these Molotov names? Behind me, I've got the Earma e Red Eagle G Master GB three four six seven WQ SU dash B one. Almost lost my breath saying all of that. Now this is a WQHD 165 hertz gaming monitor, and in this review you can see if it's actually worth its price tag, because in the UK it can be found for roughly 450 pounds. Now to kick off this review, I do want to talk about its display inputs, and here the monitor has two DisplayPort 1.2 inputs, which is perfectly suitable to run 3440 times 1440 at 165 hertz, and also has two HDMI 2.0 ports. Now the latter is a bit important because here if you do have a laptop for example with an HDMI output no matter in terms of the port version that you have you'll be able to output a maximum of 3440 at 1440p at 100 Hertz only and therefore you won't be able to benefit from the 165 Hertz refresh rate that this monitor offers now with that in mind let's talk about its input lag and here the monitor achieved 3.2 milliseconds in my control test and this is pretty impressive for a ultra wide 1440p VA 100 165 Hertz monitor. Nevertheless here it's not as impressive as the likes of the HP X34 which is one of its main competitors that comes in at a similar price tag and as a result if you do want the lowest input lag that you can achieve you might want to look at the HP alternative instead. Nevertheless in all grand scheme of things it's really impressive and from my own subjective testing when it came to playing Counter-Strike Global Offensive I found that the monitor did respond really well to my inputs. Now of course input lag is only one side of the puzzle and we have to talk about the response time of the monitor. Now it really depends as to what overdrive level that you run on because of course that will impact the overall response time. Now in its maximum overdrive level which is level 5 I did notice a little bit of inverse ghosting game like Counter-Strike Global Offensive but it was perfectly playable and so much so that I actually used the monitor in this setting. However, when I went to a graphically intense game such as Destiny 2, I did notice a lot of inverse ghosting that was occurring and quite a bit of smearing. As a result, I had to dial down the overdrive modes to level 2 and level 3. Now, what does this mean in terms of the overall response time or the average G2G response time of the monitor? Well, you'll be able to see on your screen right now via the OSRTT that I was able to measure the average response time of the monitor while overdrive was disabled at 7.93. Of course, this improves gradually, so we're going down to 7.16 in level 1, level 2 goes down to 5.94, then in terms of level 3 mode, it goes down to 4.9 milliseconds, which is very impressive, then we get down to really impressive levels at level 4, which goes to 3.77, and then level 5 finally leads on to a 3.24 milliseconds average G2D response time, which is frankly absolutely superb. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say over here is that you can get this monitor running at a really fast response time. However, you will have to incur that amount of inverse ghosting depending on the game you're playing. So in this respect, if you're playing a graphically intense game, you're going to want to run on level 2 or level 3, whereby the response time hovers around 6 milliseconds. But if you're able to cope with that inverse ghosting in a less graphically intense game such as CSGO, then you'll have an average G2G time of 3.24 milliseconds. Now to further emphasize the point you'll be able to see here the UFO test whereby I go from level off all the way to level 5 and then also with MBR which reduces the motion blur and therefore means that the UFO is a lot clearer. This was on its maximum MBR setting. Here you can see that the overall inverse ghosting can be noticed on a little bit more darker scenes while on the lighter scenes it's not as noticeable. So it's just something to consider over here when you are playing certain games. So with all of that in mind, it brings me on to its overall casual gaming experience. And here I should point out that the monitor does have AMD FreeSync technology built in. And in my case, as I have an RTX 3080, while connected over DisplayPort, I was also able to run NVIDIA G-Sync. Here I had no problems running the Pendulum demo, both in terms of black screen issues or any sort of flickering. None of these were present and therefore made for a better tear-free gaming experience. The monitor does have a FreeSync or VR range of 48 up to 165 Hertz. Now this is quite important because if you do drop below those frames, which is very much the case with other monitors out there, and you have your graphic settings ramped up like I did on Destiny 2, you might notice a bit of scanning lines or a bit of stuttering. Now this also does bring me on to its HDR experience, and here the monitor does support HDR to be simultaneously running with NVIDIA G-Sync at 165Hz and 1440p, which is a great combination. However, the overall HDR experience, very much like many of its competitors that also support an HDR 
signal and HDR400 certification is somewhat subpar. If you really want a better HDR experience, you should be looking at monitors that have the HDR600 certification or above. I do appreciate that's a different type of price category when it comes to ultra-wide gaming monitors, but it's just something to consider. I didn't want to get your hopes up when it came to the overall HDR experience that you're going to be attaining with this Iyama monitor. Elsewhere, I did also find it odd that this monitor does not automatically enable the HDR mode via the OSD when it sees an HDR signal. I found it a little bit odd and a bit of a weird behavior because it's not something I've noticed previously while reviewing other monitors, be it from the manufacturer or some of its competitors. Indeed, here you have to manually enable the HDR mode through the OSD in order to benefit from that peak brightness. If you don't do that, then the monitor will not be showing you an HDR signal and therefore means that you will get a lowered experience when you are expecting a high dynamic range. So moving swiftly on, a little word for console gamers. And as I did mention before, this only will accept 1440p at a maximum 100Hz refresh rate when you're running over an HDMI signal. Nevertheless, here it's quite important to know that the monitor does accept a 4K signal input. And therefore, via an HDMI cable, you can also run 4K at 60Hz, which is certainly impressive for those people who are on PlayStation or on Xbox. For those people who are on Xbox, they will be also able to run the monitor natively at 1440p, and if you're running at Full HD, then you'll be able to run 120Hz or 60Hz, both on PlayStation and on Xbox. So with the gaming section out of the way, what about when it comes to image quality? Well, this monitor has a curved 34-inch VA panel that runs 1440p at 165Hz. Now, the monitor does not have a dedicated sRGB emulation mode, and when set to its normal preset mode on the OSD, I noted a gamut coverage of 99.2% in sRGB and a gamut volume of 132.9%. Indeed, looking at the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 figures, it's got a wide color gamut. You can see here how it compares to the sRGB standard below. Now, in terms of the overall average Delta E, due to it not having that dedicated sRGB mode, it's not exactly color accurate in comparison to the sRGB standard, whereby the average Delta E sits at 2.55 and a maximum of 4.73. What really threw me off was the overall measure white point where it was completely skewed at 7546 Kelvin at 100% in comparison to the 6500 Kelvin. That said, the overall gamut curve in comparison to the 2.2 standard was pretty impressive. And similarly, the overall tested contrast ratio at a whopping 3050 to 1 is very good, although not that surprising given it is a VA panel. Now, while the raw numbers are very much important, what I will say subjectively while looking at a monitor is that it does look a little bit cloudy in comparison to its IPS alternatives out there on the market. And specifically here, if you're looking at more extreme angles, you might notice that the monitor's colors are a little bit skewed and this will be of importance for those people who are running a multi-monitor ultra-wide setup and therefore want a great visual experience no matter where they're looking and as a result here a VA panel might not be quite suited at least not the Iyama monitor that we have on review. So what about when it comes to its brightness? Well here I did allude to it in terms of the HDR section but it is very impressive to see that this monitor both in SDR and HDR can reach up to 429 nits. Better still, it gets down all the way to 68 nits, which is great for those people who play in a dark room. As for its MBR7 brightness, it's locked at 130 nits. Now, what isn't as impressive, however, is the overall brightness uniformity. Of course, this is somewhat panel lottery, but in the test of the model I had, it was a little bit off throughout the board. Now, as for the overall backlight bleed, this is something of a selling point of VA panel, specifically of its form factor in comparison to the IPS alternatives. Although you will notice a little bit of clouding, there is very little backlight bleed and therefore is better for those people who are going to be running a very dark gaming setup or wanting to watch movies. So moving on to the monitor's OSD can be accessed through a physical joystick button found behind the monitor. And the OSD is very comprehensive although not exactly perfectly laid out. Now in the picture adjust you'll find the overdrive settings which I would suggest level 5 or of course if you're running a more graphically intense game go on level 2 or level 3. Now the MBR modes cannot be used simultaneously with AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA G-Sync which is a a little thing that you should consider so therefore it will be one or the other. The gamma level you'll want to run it on level 2 which is the default. As for the audio adjust you do have a two 2 watt built in speakers and they'll be perfectly fine for basic Windows notification but if you are looking to be gaming or indeed listen to music I'd set a set of bookshelf speakers, a DAC, a headphone or a headset. You do also have a 3.5mm jack at the back of the monitor to output audio in that means as well. Now as for the colour settings I would suggest the user preset. This 
resulted in a little bit of a better and sharper experience. And here I had the red and green reduced by three notches to 47 each, we're leaving the blue at 50. Note the color test that I did before, we're basing on the color temperature on the normal mode. Now, as for the image adjust, these are a few extra settings that you might want to enable. These are ones that are provided by the manufacturer, but I don't personally suggest them or recommend them, other than leaving the sharp and soft mode at level three. Now you do also have the setup menu, whereby here you have the ability to enable or disable the opening logo and the LED which is positioned at the front of the monitor. Now here you'll also see the HDR toggle and the FreeSync Premium toggle and these are both relatively important depending on what you're going to be actually using the monitor for. Finally in terms of display information it's very useful to know the refresh rate and the resolution that you're running on. So with the OSC section out of the way I should also point out there's a few physical buttons found behind the monitor next to the joystick button which allow you to change the inputs and of course switch off the monitor altogether which is a great power saving feature. Now the monitor's design is really good where it's got a three side borderless look and the bottom bezel isn't too thick and has got a normal finish to it. In other words it's black greyish type of look. The same could be said about the stand. Now the stand is also very sturdy and provides height, tilt and swivel adjustments. Now oddly it does also pivot but there is a sticker found at the front of the monitor which specifically tells you not to pivot the monitor. I'm not really sure why and it's quite intriguing to see why a monitor manufacturer would provide a stand that has pivot adjustment but yet advises against it. Nevertheless I'll be asking Yama for comment on it and if I do find an answer I'll pop it down in the description below. So with all of that in mind it brings me on to my verdict and the most important important part is its gaming performance and here this Iyama monitor does a stupendously good job, both in terms of its refresh rate, resolution and input lag. Of course the response time is affected depending on terms of the overdrive modes that you choose, but even in terms of the more visually appealing overdrive modes, so level 2 or level 3, you're still getting a very responsive panel, and as such is a monitor I can recommend to casual gamers out there, and it gets my performance award. Now it's worth considering that if you do not care about HDR nor the overall peak brightness of around 420 odd nits, you might want to consider the AOC CU34G2X, which receives around 300 nits instead and doesn't have HDR, but it's otherwise very similar to this Iyama monitor. Elsewhere, my top pick for ultra-wide gaming monitors is the HP X34. While it has a flat IPS panel instead of a curved VA panel, it is absolutely stupendous across the board, whereby it offers fantastic gaming credentials and also pinpoint sRGB colour accuracy, making it a great pick for those people who are doing image editing or video grading alongside gaming as well. Now if you've liked this independent detail review, definitely do drop a like, subscribe and hit that bell notification. It really does help. But if you've done it already, I just want to thank you in advance. As such, I've been Totally Dubs, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves, and goodbye.